Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Old News, where the fossils are old, but discoveries are new. My name is Laura Beth. I will be your host today. Uh, it's so good to be back. Um, and so since I'm hosting, I'm going to be keeping an eye on our chat. So if you have any questions or comments, you can type them into the chat. And we would really love to hear from you. We love the questions you guys ask. So um, please, please type those in and we'll make sure that we get some answers. Um, and I want to remind you all that we have captions available. They are computer generated. Um, to see those captions, you just click that button that says CC on the YouTube video. And we have old news bingo. So if you are playing bingo today and you get bingo, you can let us know in the chat. Um, we would we'd love to hear if you win bingo. I'll drop the link to virtual bingo in the chat in just a minute. First, I'm going to introduce or reintroduce our expert, Dr. Christian Kammerer, the museum's research curator of paleontology. Hey, Christian. Hey, Laura Beth, great to see you again. It's so good to see you too. It's so good to be back with old news. And yeah. I'm really excited about this topic. Yeah, no, so am I. I think we've got some really cool stuff to talk about uh, and to see today, because um, we're gonna be talking about eyes. Um, that's right, the peepers to watch. Um, so I think that we as humans, as mammals, as vertebrates, we have a very kind of specific idea about what is normal for eyes. Um, and the idea, two eyes good, more eyes than that, not great. Um, sometimes scary. Uh, but of course, in the animal kingdom, there are many more types and configurations of visual sensory organs, eyes and eye-like structures uh, than we have. The one that people you know, are probably familiar with in the arthropods uh, is so that's the fact that spiders have many eyes. They usually have eight eyes, it can be, can be fewer than that, um, set up in various configurations on their head. Um, but what people might not realize is that a lot of other arthropods also have, have multiple eyes. Um, and in some cases they have, they have many eyes in places where we might not even expect them. Um, so of course here is a, a horseshoe crab, a, a beloved, uh, member of our own, uh, Atlantic coastal fauna. Um, so horseshoe crabs, they're not true crabs. They're a member of the larger group of arthropods that does include things like spiders and scorpions, um, these the chelicerates. And you know, thinking again with sort of our, our human biases for what eyes are, you can see on this animal is it has two pretty obvious eyes. It has these uh, so-called lateral eyes. So in horseshoe crabs, these are our compound eyes. So a lot of insects you know, have compound eyes, a lot of arthropods do. This is basically where the eye is made up of a bunch of like little kind of individual components called omatidia. Um, and together they produce an image. Um, they kind of like average out. And the compound eyes generally, they are not as good at like image resolution and image quality as our eyes are. Um, but they generally have like wider view angles and they can also see movement better and in some cases can see different colors and things. So there are advantages to having compound eyes. Um, but these aren't the only eyes in the horseshoe crab. So there are these things that like look like eyes as we understand them. Um, but there's actually a total of like 10 eyes in a horseshoe crab. So they, in addition to the, the big compound eyes, the lateral ones on the side, which you can see in, in front view here, also these tiny little dots, they almost like pinprick on the front of the cephalic shield there. It has these little median eyes. And this distinction between median eyes, so eyes in the center of the head and lateral eyes, eyes on the side of the head, is something that we see throughout arthropods, although it's been sort of developed and evolved in different ways. Um, but in addition to these four eyes, horseshoe crabs, they also have sort of these secondary simple lateral eyes. 
They have ventral eyes, which are eyes on the underside of the head. Um, they have an eye that has kind of like fuses with the brain during development and becomes sort of this frontal gland. Um, and even their, their tail is, is a sort of eye. And I think this might be the most surprising aspect of, of their sort of visual anatomy. Um, so they have photoreceptors on the telson, which is sort of like the spine or the tail that comes off of the end of the horseshoe crab. Now, I mean, these aren't, it depends on what you want to call an eye. So a photoreceptor means they can tell the difference between light and dark. They can't resolve images. They can't really like see anything, but it can tell whether it's light or dark. And a lot of organisms have these sort of photoreceptor um, tissues that you know can't really resolve images in the way that an eye can. Um, but in some cases, you know, this is all that they have. There are organisms that can just tell light from dark and are otherwise, you know, not visually capable. Um, and then there are animals that have both image forming eyes and photoreceptors. Um, why the horseshoe crab needs all these different types of eyes, I, I don't know, and I think is not, not totally known. Um, and may have something to do with aspects of sort of the, the deep time history of this group that are still poorly understood. Um, horseshoe crabs, you know, they're one of these groups that is sometimes called a living fossil, which is a term don't really use because it's, it's misleading. Um, but it is true that horseshoe crabs have remained sort of very morphologically static. So they've looked basically the same for the last 300 million years. So some aspects of their morphology may be sort of reflecting adaptation, you know, in the, the far different distant past. Um, so, Horseshoe crabs, you know, have both the median eyes and the lateral, the compound eyes, but this is certainly not unique to them among arthropods. When you look at insects, the same thing is present. So here's a, here's a bee, um, and you can see there's this little set of median eyes. There are three of them up at the top of the head, in addition to these very obvious lateral eyes. So the median eyes in insects are called ocelli. Um, and these are these are simple eyes as opposed to the the compound eyes on the lateral side. Um, in some of these other arthropod groups like chelicerates, you see variation in sort of the style of the eye. So in the bee, the compound eyes, the lateral eyes were the the largest ones, um, and the median eyes were very small. Whereas in a scorpion, like this one here, you can see the median eyes are the largest and these lateral ones made up of this little cluster of sort of eyelets um, are the small ones. So there is, there's a lot of variation in how these eyes actually work among different types of arthropods. Um, so you see the median eye there, the lateral eye cluster there. Um, so cr a lot of crustaceans have lost the median eyes but most of them have it at least in their, their larval phase. So this is a, the Nopolius larva of a copepod, which is a type of small marine crustacean. And you can see that red structure there. This is this ancestral median eye that seems to have been conserved throughout arthropod history. Um, so as I said, most of these are lost into adulthood. So if you look at sort of a typical crustacean that you're probably familiar with, the American lobster, um, it has, Although having a body form overall, like pretty different from ours, its eye setup is something that we we recognize. You know, it just has the two eyes uh, laterally on each side, so you can kind of look eye to eye with an with a lobster and sort of know know what it's seeing. Um, but this isn't true for all crustaceans. There are a few that retain that nopplier median eye into adulthood, uh, like these tadpole shrimp. Um, called triops, which means three eyes. Um, so you can see that it still has that, that little median eye in the middle and then those two compound lateral eyes that actually look a lot like those of the horseshoe crab, um, even though these are very distantly related organisms. Um, when we go into the fossil record, we also see this sort of split between median eyes and lateral eyes being present throughout arthropod evolution. So these are eurypterids, these are sea scorpions. Um, they're a group more closely related to horseshoe crabs than to true scorpions, but they're within that larger chelicerate clade. Um, and you can see here, as in the horseshoe crab, you have these sort of, you know, crescent-shaped 
lateral compound eyes, and then these very small median eyes. So this, this break really does seem to have been happening throughout arthropod evolution. Um, and indeed may go even to the pre-arthropod parts of their evolutionary history. Um, so if you look at these things, which, which aren't you know, proper members of the phylum arthropoda, but are usually interpreted as very early diverging members of this, this larger pan-arthropod group. That means that they're on, on the stem. They're more closely related to arthropods than anything living today. Things like Anomalocaris, or this animal that we've talked about on old, old news before, Opabinia, that has this very strange anatomy. Um, and part of that is that the fact that it has five eyes, um, which is certainly very unusual for any animal. But when you think of it in terms of this paradigm of median eyes and lateral eyes in arthropods still being present in, in living forms, it makes a little bit more sense and sort of fits into that bigger picture. Um, so that's why it is surprising that probably the best known fossil arthropods of any kind, indeed some of the best known fossils uh, in the world, uh, seemed for the longest time to be an exception to this rule. So I'm talking about the trilobites. So trilobites lived throughout the entire Paleozoic era. So they lived for hundreds of millions of years. Um, incredibly diverse marine invertebrates uh, and very abundant. You know, they're known from literally millions of specimens. I mean, there are beds of, you know, just full chock-a-block with trilobite fossils. Like, if you found any fossil in your life, it's probably a trilobite if it's not like a clamshell or a shark tooth. Um, trilobites, anywhere there's Paleozoic rock, basically, uh, marine rock, you, you can find them. Um, and they have a lot of diversity in, in shape. They all follow this basic, you know, sort of trilobe pattern, hence their name, broken into three parts. Um, but within that, there is a lot of differences in all these different trilobite groups. And that includes in their eye morphology. So you have very uh, strangely developed things like this Asifus Kovalevsky eye. Um, this is a, a phacopid trilobite that has the eyes on stalk. Um, why this is is uncertain. Possible that it was would have been uh, you know hiding in in muddy bottoms or something like that, where it wanted just sort of the tip of the eyes to poke out and the rest of the body to remain hidden and safe under the substrate. Um, you also have this animal, uh, Urbanachyle. This is a, another sort of uh, fatcopid trilobite that has these hugely tall eyes. It's like some of the most like wildly developed eyes in the animal kingdom um, that researchers working on these trilobites have argued actually served as kind of like sunshades where the eyes themselves had these little sort of rims at the top that would have provided shade. Um, so these must have been living in probably shallow, very well lit waters, um, such that they would have needed to defend themselves to a degree against the sun. Um, and especially when the eye is this tall for it to, it to function kind of as a single unit, this is a type of compound eye. You probably want, you know, fairly even light. You don't want, you know, different parts of the eyes to be telling you different things. Um, and so Urban Akaili is a member of this group, sort of phacopids, which have a unique type of eye that has actually not been seen in any other animal. It existed only within one group of trilobites um, and has not reappeared since. It's called the schizocroal eye. Um, so this is, it's a type of compound eye, but um, unlike in insects where you have these uh, omatidia that are kind of like little flattened tiles almost often on the, the, the eye surface. Um, the individual lenses on the Skysacrol trilobite eye are really kind of like these little mineralized spheres with magnesium cores um, that are, re there are relatively few of them compared to the omatidia in most compound eyes, um, but each lens is a lot better developed with this really deep gap between them. So what exactly they were doing with these eyes is a subject of some debate. Some trilobite workers have argued that this is, you know, kind of like a, a hyper eye. So, you know, compound eyes, they don't show image quality as well as, 
as our eyes. Um, and this may have been arthropods kind of experimenting with a way to improve resolution of images by having relatively fewer um, but higher resolution lenses um, making up the compound eye. Uh, there are a few sort of you know lenses in the like optical engineering world that independently arrived at this same general ground plan that trilobites came up with like 400 million years earlier. So there is there's there is some merit to this, but sort of its exact function, especially how it connects with the nervous system, whether each of these lenses had their own uh, you know complete set of little little uh, optic neurons. Um, remains to be seen. But so the, all of that, you know, has been known for, for a while, although, you know, a lot of the more recent research on skies of crow eyes only happened in the last 20 years or so. Um, but within just the last few weeks, uh, new eyes have dropped in trilobites. Um, so for trilobites have been studied, you know, by the, by the millions, for over 200 years now. And during that entire time, it was thought that they, unlike most other arthropods, lack median eyes. Um, and certainly, like we have so many, you know, amazing complete specimens of adult trilobites that we can clearly see that there's no median eyes there. It was just sort of assumed that, yeah, median eyes absent in this group. Um, but uh, recent work looking at very young trilobites uh, has shown that there are these these little dots in the center of the sort of the cephalon, the the head region of trilobites, that are very good matches for the median eyes of other arthropods. And what seems to be happening in trilobites is similar to some of these crustaceans, that they would have had them ancestrally. So whatever the the common ancestor of trilobites and other arthropods was it had both the lateral compound eyes and the median simple eyes. And then somewhere within trilobite evolutionary history, uh, they started to focus attention basically just on the lateral eyes and they lost the median eyes as adults. Um, but that sort of underlying developmental architecture for the eyes is still present probably in their, their earliest juvenile or larval phases. Um, and when they're, uh, when they're adults, it's lost, but you can see in these really tiny trilobites, so also look at the, the scale bars on those. Some of them are just a few micro, few hundred microns. Um, even the biggest one is only like a couple millimeters across. So these are really, really quite small, very young trilobites. Um, and some of these are also like under the cuticle of the head. So these, even at this size, the eyes already would have been kind of like covered in shell and on their way to being lost. And it's really only due to the incredible sample size of trilobites, where because we have so many, we have basically every, every phase in the life history represented. Um, and from modern imaging techniques, looking carefully at some of these things, that these researchers were able to find uh, basically something completely new about the anatomy of one of the, the very best known and understood fossil groups, um, which I think is kind of an amazing story of, in terms of like what the fossil record still has to, to teach us. Um, I mean, this doesn't change like our big picture understanding of what's happening with evolution or with trilobite history, because it fits into this narrative of arthropods generally having median eyes. Um, but just the idea that, you know, you could, you know, pick the best known animal in the world, that there's still just fundamental aspects of its anatomy left to be discovered uh, when you're dealing with fossils, I think is, is very exciting. It sort of speaks to one of the major appeals of paleontology, um, which is that it, the, the you know, deep time is kind of terra incognita. Um, we, we can never know everything about it. Much of the information has been lost, but we do keep pushing forward uh, each and every year and still, still making big discoveries. Um, a sort of a final thought here, you know, median eyes, they do, they do seem weird to us. Um, but that is like not only a vertebrate centric feature, but it's also sort of a mammal centric feature because when we think of some other even terrestrial vertebrates, uh, like lizards, something we've spoken about 
on old news before is they do have this this uh, sensory structure in the middle of the head, the pineal foramen or the parietal eye. So sometimes called a third eye, but it is also not image forming. It's another photoreceptor um, that tells light from dark and especially is used in reptiles that are, you know, need to be up to bask and absorb sunlight in the morning to get going. Um, so lizards that are at more temperate latitudes, especially. Um, and other reptile relatives like the tuatara, and then in deep time, like in the Permian and the Triassic, a lot of the animals had these pineal eyes, and they've kind of been been lost through time, um, but they're still present in a few creatures today. Um, and so that's that's all I've got to say about eyes. Uh, but I do have one old news update. Blah, blah, blah. So you know, on this show, we really try to bring you the up to the minute. Uh, recent discoveries in paleontology. And because of that, there are, you know, it as a science is constantly evolving, constantly changing. We're always learning new things, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, trilobites had eyes that we didn't know about, um, or some of our previous interpretations of the fossil record turn out to not be, not be true. Um, and get, there's, you know, it's a very active field. There's a lot of debate. Um, yesterday's interpretation can become tomorrow's overturned hypothesis. So this is an animal question mark that we talked about in 2021, Proto Melissian, um, which was described at the time as the earliest known bryozoan, bryozoans being the only skeletonized, so hard part having group of animals without a record from the Cambrian when all the other animal phyla exploded onto the scene. Um, so this was, it has, you know, bryozoans must have evolved by then um, because their closest relatives are already around then, but there were no fossils of Cambrian bryozoans. So people were very excited to finally have one. Um, but a new paper that just came out uh, has uh, argued against this interpretation, saying that the proto Melissian fossils are not a bryozoan and indeed are not an animal at all, but are actually a type of alga um, seaweed called a daisy clad, um, based on really exceptionally preserved daisy clad algae, also from the Cambrian of China, um, shown on the right there, with a great similarity to daisy clads are still alive today. It's a, you know, it's a living group of algae. And I must say it's pretty convincing. So when you look at the living daisy clad alga on the left and the reconstruction even of proto Melissian, where they argued for it being a bryozoan, there is a lot of similarity. So I'm, I'm on board with this new interpretation. Uh, it is a bummer not to have, you know, that sort of last checkbox filled in of having bryozoans in the Cambrian. Um, but that just means that there's, there's opportunity for someone else's amazing discovery in the future. That means we just have to look harder, uh, and keep, you know, keep our eyes out to find, uh, I think the inevitable Cambrian bryozoan record. Well, Christian, I have to say I'm kind of sad because, yeah, that was really exciting about the, the bryozoan. But, um, man, what a good example of how um, quickly things can change in this field. I think that that's really cool. And Science marches on. Yeah, sci science marches on. Exactly. Um, going back to the eyes topic. Mm -hmm. Of course, everyone, um, feel, if you have questions about the bryozoan slash algae, you know, you can ask questions about that as well. Um, I'm going to focus on eyes for the for the rest because y'all had some pretty good questions so far. All, um, right. all right. So the first one, Christian, is a baby trilobite called a baby bite? Um, you know, I, I don't think so. I've never seen that term used in the literature. Uh, okay. but I, I think as, as jargon, certainly, uh, the, you can, you can throw that out there. See if it, see if it catches on. Do you know if they have a name? Kind of like how, um, you know, baby platypus are called puggles, right? So, so I've heard. <laughs> Do you think it should it be ba baby bite or trilo baby? Trilo baby. <laughs> trilo baby almost sounds like a um like a wrestler name, you know. 
maybe not a very fierce wrestler. <laughs> get, get you in the figure four trilo baby. Step into the squared circle, brother. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. I swear I have an on-topic question now. All right. Uh, so Anne um, was wondering if the the eye structure on one of those trilobites that had the uh, almost like sunglasses, you know, but mm -hmm. it was part of its eyes. Is that like a honeycomb structure? Is what she was wondering. So that is, that's one of those skies of Crowell eyes. So it's not quite like the honeycomb that is, would be more like a lot of these other arthropod compound eyes. They really are these individual mineralized lenses, um, each of which would have been image forming to some degree. And then, you know, the arthropod brains, they interpret all the basically all the visual input from across the eye field. Um, so on a very rough level, operating the same way as uh, appositional compound eyes in modern arthropods, but doing something special with those really discrete lenses, like maybe better vision. Yeah, I think that, that eye type is very interesting. And you said we haven't seen it in any other animals, right? No, so there are a few insects today that do have relatively few omatidia, and also, you know, there's some flies, some wasps, where the the components of the compound eye are very spherical almost, but nothing has these like really deep separations between the lenses or like this magnesium core system that they seem to have developed. So yeah, nothing nothing else that we know of in animal history was quite like this guy's a crow all eye. Mm -hmm. So um, in thinking about how eyes have, eyes and eyesight, how it's evolved over the years, do we know what the first eyes were like? Like, were they kind of like those median eyes that we saw in the, the, the baby bites, the baby trilobites? Yeah, so it, it is, it's a little hard to tell because eyes, image forming eyes have, almost certainly evolved independently in different groups of animals. So our eyes versus like an octopus's eyes, you know, both are, you know, basically two lateral eyes with extremely good image forming capacity. Um, and a lot of kind of the, the basics of how the eye is constructed are the same in those two, but they develop in entirely different ways. The, how they respond to the nervous system is in different ways. Like we have eyes that basically show us the world, you know, that when light comes into our eyes, the way our eyes are constructed, we see the world upside down and then our brain just like reinterprets it. So it's right side up. Whereas when an octopus sees the world, it's the way its eyes are constructed, the image is right side up and then it's just interpreted as such by the brain. Um, and these trilobites, if they had, you know, good image forming capability, that's also independent of mollusks and of vertebrates. But all of these, so there's a lot of the underlying genetics for eye formation that are conserved across all animals. Um, and it's likely that they, there is some ancestral, at least photosensitive cell type, um, that is kind of the progenitor of eyes and the degree to which it was sort of co-opted and elaborated on for image forming would have happened independently um, because eyes go all the way back they aren't present in sponges but they are present in some you know like jellyfish and their relative um, so they they are quite ancient they probably go back to the pre-cambrian um, and in the jellyfish at least like they predate even having a brain so it's unknown how really like they they use the eyes when they can't it's in the eyes of some jellyfish like those of box jellyfish are quite complex in their way so how they interpret the sort of visual stimuli without a brain is something that sort of remains a topic of study wow yeah i um i didn't even know that about jellyfish actually until yeah there are, there are there are a few species that have that have eyes. Yeah, oh, that's so cool. Um, and so I was wondering about the the tiny trilobite babies that may or may not be baby bites. 
Um, mm -hmm. How how were they fossilized to be like the first known trilobite fossil that we saw these eyes in? I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. So I mean, it really is. It's kind of just playing the percentages, right? So if you have enough fossils of an abundant enough animal, eventually you will get parts of its life history or parts of its anatomy that aren't typically preserved in the fossil record. So, I mean, you can think about something we've talked about on old news lots of times before, preservation potential, how likely any individual organism is to enter the fossil record. Where generally, if you're like the bigger and kind of, you know, more resistant to destruction, so whether it is hardness um, or, you know, resistance to chemical weathering or whatever, so something like a tooth, like a clamshell, these are things with very high preservation potential. They're very likely to enter the fossil record. Things that are soft bodied, um, things that are very small, these are unlikely to enter the fossil record. Um, but even something that's soft bodied and small, if there are enough of them, they will get their way in there. Um, it's just like eventually the right circumstances for preserving them will occur. And with trilobites, you know, a lot of these are found in sort of these, these kind of mass death beds where you just have thousands and thousands of specimens. Um, including a few, a few smaller ones. Um, so trilobites, like all arthropods, they would have had chitinous exoskeletons. In many trilobites, it was further mineralized um, to really like reinforce the shell, um, which is also adding their preservation potential. So in the smaller ones, they're they're less mineralized, but it's still, you know, they have around the same preservation potential as a lot of insects today and insects. You know, although it's not as great as we might want, they do have an extensive fossil record. So really it's just, you know, looking out for cases where there are lots and lots of fossils. And if you look hard enough, eventually you'll find some things that you might not see otherwise in a more poorly sampled area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and folks that are watching, let us know in the chat if you've ever found fossil trilobites, because um, like Christian said, they are probably one of the more common ones that you'd find. And um, Christian, one of our participants, Tam Jammy, has written that um, trilobites are fantastic. And there's an author, <laughs> yeah, there's an author named Richard Forty or Richard mm -hmm. Forte, perhaps, who wrote a book called Trilobite. Um, yeah, uh, he is a, a, a very eminent and well-known trilobitologist. Indeed, was the author on that that paper on the, the eye shade trilobite Urbanakaili from Morocco. So that would be a good book to check out if we wanted to learn yeah, more about trilobites. The book, simply entitled Trilobites, uh, <laughs> is a good read uh, and has some really amazing photos of various you know trilobites of all different types. Cool. Uh, so Tam wanted to know how, or do we know how many species the eye spots have been found in? And so when they say spot, oh, go ahead, go ahead. The median eyes, yeah. The it's median only eyes. Two thus far. So yeah, Olacopleura and Cyclopygi are the, the two trilobites that in this most recent paper, they had found very small juveniles that showed the median eyes. Um, I suspect that more will be found in the future, just because, you know, if it's thought that something doesn't have an anatomical structure, generally people don't go looking for it. Uh, once it is known, once that search image is present in a scientist's brain, it's time to start opening the drawers in museums around the world. Um, and more specimens usually show up, sometimes very quickly. So I'm sure after this paper came out, you know, various curators uh, went looking for potential median eyes uh, in their specimens. Um, I had a quick look through our trilobite holdings, but they're they're pretty small, unfortunately. We don't have too many trilobites just because they're not we don't have rocks of the right age here in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So um, this is this is not a good state to find trilobites in. Most of the southeast is pretty trilobite poor. When you get so in in the northeast and when you get into the Midwest, there are yeah, lots and lots of trilobites. Um, I think this may be our last question about trilobites or eyes. Um, Anne wanted to know: Can trilobites see color, or could they? Um, probably it is, it's a little hard to tell, um, because, you know, there is a lot of variability in color vision versus, 
various kinds of low color vision to true black and white vision, um, even among animals that have functionally similar eyes. You know, lots of mammals can only see in black and white. And if you were to fossilize, like, you know, uh, a dog's eye, uh, an opossum's eye, and a human's eye, you would not be able to tell the difference. It would just kind of look like a smear of goo. Um, so like the, the complex sets of rods and cones and various opsins and things that determine uh, degree of color vision um, is generally not something that we can see in the fossil record. Uh, by comparisons though with modern arthropods, um, many of the arthropods that have compound eyes do have fairly good color vision. Um, indeed, some of them you may be aware can see colors that we can't. So there are lots of insects that can see in the ultraviolet or infrared, which are parts of the spectrum that are not parts of what's called the visible spectrum. And when we say visible spectrum, we mean visible to us, to humans. So there are animals that can see these, these, uh, these colors that we can't. Um, and there are lots and lots of work done on things like looking at the ultraviolet patterning in things like uh, flowers that bees can see or flies for pollination purposes, that they see sort of a whole new world of color or like mantis shrimp also are known for having very complex color vision. Um, and it's likely that trilobites you know, would have to some degree as well. But also remember that trilobites are a long lived and very diverse group. So within that group, there was probably the gamut of ones with good color vision, ones with poor color vision. There are trilobites that may have not had any eyes, um, that would not have had visual capacity because they were living down in, in the mud. Um, and, you know, we didn't really need to see. Um, we know nothing about, we have no fossil record of like ancient caves. We know animals that live in caves today often lose the eyes just because there's no, there's no light. There's no reason for, for visual acuity. Um, so we don't, that's an aspect of deep time that we don't have really have a fossil record of sort of deep marine uh, cave system. So who knows what sort of strange eyeless trilobites may have been living in, in the far reaches of, of marine caves. Mm -hmm. Fossilized cave. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I so Christian, I was um, I was I was, I was lying here when I said that was the last question um, okay. about whether or not trilobites can see color. Because I actually have one more question for you about eyes. Yeah, sure. So if you could like switch bodies with any other animal just to experience its eyesight, which mm -hmm. and it can be you know extinct or alive, what what animal would you switch with? just to see how different their world is visually. Yeah, I mean, if it's living things, it probably would be something like a mantis shrimp that sees into other parts of the spectrum um, or really any, any compound eyed organism that can see into other parts of the spectrum. Um, for fossil ones, it probably would be one of these specopid trilobites just to give me some insight into what the skies of crow eye was doing. Um, because with the living things, like we can, as advances in sort of like looking at neurobiology while organisms are alive are proceeding, we will know more and more about how a lot of these living insects and other arthropods are able to see the world, even if we'll never fully understand what they're seeing. Um, but with these fossil things, like it really, that could go, uh, unresolved for for hundreds of years yet, so if ever. Yeah, it could take a while for us to um, get that technology. Yeah, I think yeah. I would choose a prehistoric animal too. Mm -hmm. Just just well, for, and, like and, you said, the, yeah. Um, any, any, right. In particular? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I'm gonna switch gears here, and we had some questions about the bryozoan, which- Oh, about Protomolacion, yeah. Probably uh, an algae. <laughs> Um, so Anne wanted to know, wasn't the bryozoan tiny? And I yeah, don't remember. They are, they are tiny. Um, so these are, the fossils are, are very small. Bryozoans are, of course, colonial organisms. So they are this lattice work of skeletonized septa, little compartments, 
which each contain a, a zooid, so a little filter feeding organism that lives in this, this colony. Um, and each of those zooids are, are tiny, like teeny tiny little things, like nearing microscopic levels. Um, and so they're on the same scale as, as the alga. So they're, they're very similar in size. So like, again, if you, let's look at the, so this, this image of the alga is greatly expanded. So this is also down to like each of those little bits is at the, the millimeter or less level. Um, and so you can see with the, on that figure to the right of these algae that very closely match protomolacion, that the, the complete thing, the complete like alga uh, is maybe four or five millimeters across. So these are, these are quite small. Um, you can see in like D there that the whole alga is living on this one tiny little shell. So yeah, they're all in the same size range and it is, it is very small indeed. And, um, excuse me, one of our colleagues was wondering um, if the arguments that the scientists used um, to say that it was probably more likely algae and not a bryozoan was one of their arguments that the fossil had very structured cell walls. Like, was that mm. part of the argument at all? Because it does, in those pictures, it looks like they're like hexagonal walls. Yeah. Yeah, so it is, not much of it was at the ultra-structural level in terms of their argumentation. Um, so unfortunately, these, these are kind of preserved as a, as a film on the rock. So unlike, you know, a lot of, like vascular plant fossils, you can do thin sections and see the cell walls. To my knowledge, they haven't been able to do that with these, these Cambrian kind of algal smears. Um, but that would be a, I think that would be a smoking gun in terms of uh, algal support is if they were able to look at the, the microstructure of the individual cells, um, because you can, that shows the difference between um, animals and plants very easily and algae to certainly to a degree. I mean, the problem with all of these, everything kind of outside animal plants is that you get into these kind of intermediate histologies. So like this is an al it's a green alga. So it is kind of clo closer to plants than other things. I mean, a lot of what are called algae are all across life. Like it's not a single group seaweed. Um, there are a lot of independent groups red algae, brown algae, green algae, some of which are close to plants, some of which are close to animals, some of which are close to fungi sort of thing. Um, so, and there is, that's reflected to a degree in their development, certainly their genetics um, and their cell structure. So you can get things that aren't animals that have kind of animal-like cells and you can get things that aren't plants that have plant-like cells. But if you see something with plant-like cells in what is supposed to be a bryozoan, you can be pretty sure that it's not an animal. Right. Wow. Okay. So do you think that will be possible for them to look at the microscopic structure, like do a, a thin slice? and? Yeah. So I don't know about Proto-Melissian itself, um, but certainly in some of these other things that they've interpreted as daisy clad algae, uh, in some of the assemblages, the, the, like the fidelity of preservation is, is very high. And I know in the past they have done sort of some of this ultra structural kind of cell level work on some of the invertebrate fossils. So if the same degree of preservation is present in these supposed algae, it, it should be possible. Cool. Very cool. Um, well, everyone, that is all the time we have today for old news. Um, thank you so much for sharing your questions and comments with us. Uh, yeah, great question. Yeah, for real. Um, Christian, as usual. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, can't wait until the next program. It's on May 9th at 1 p.m. Eastern time again. So we hope that you can join us then. Um, and we actually, we're going to have some fun with that one because it's the last episode of this season before the summer break, um, which is when hopefully Christian will be able to go out into the field and do field work. So um, we are actually going to do our old newsies awards at the end of our May oh, yeah. program. <laughs> so
So um, tune in if you aren't already on our email list and you want to vote in the old newsies, just um, look at our YouTube videos at our, this YouTube playlist. I'll put a link um, to the voting site in our chat. Or sorry, not in our chat, in the video description. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone. Um, have a great day. Thanks again for joining. Bye. Yeah. Bye, everybody.